Thanks, guys. So, on February 14th, 2007, I made a colossal mistake. Valentine's Day, 2007. Uh, because that's when I committed Django.contrib.local flavor. Uh, now, for those of you who don't know what this is, uh, before this, we had in the forms library a bunch of validation for US specific stuff like zip codes, valid zip code, maybe valid phone number, I forget, like valid state, valid US territory. And I felt kind of guilty on Valentine's Day 2007, and I was like, you know, we really should put this in a more generic place. Let's call it local flavor, and then maybe we can have some other cultural or country things. Uh, so I did that, and almost immediately, we got patches. We got patches from all over the world. You could just sense the national pride. Oh, I want my country in there. I want my culture's zip codes or my country's zip codes or phone number validation rules. And these days, fast forward to 2012, we have uh, almost 50 directories in there. Uh, so this is, these are all the country codes in Django.contrib.localflavor. This is a huge problem for us, we realized. So not only is it just a massive amount of files, uh, which is a problem for stuff like Google App Engine, which uh, at one point, I don't know if they still do this, but they had a limit on how many files you could upload. So people using Django are like, uh, we've got like hundreds of files in Django, wasteful. But it is also a huge problem for the Django core team because we're now having to make sure that all these country validation rules are valid, uh, which isn't really what we want to do. So just yesterday, I took a look at our GitHub pull requests, and I saw so many pull requests just devoted to local flavor. So there, here's a patch for validating Great Britain telephone numbers. Here's one for the correct Lithuanian short date format. Here's one for the Romanian phone number field validation rules. Here's one for uh, adding Mexican social security numbers. Uh, here's one for, uh, I guess, Sao Paulo phone numbers in Brazil. And we were looking at this, I was looking at this a couple months ago, and I was like, why are we doing this? Uh, and then I thought back to something that, this is a bit of a joke for us on the core team, uh, we like to poke fun at our friends on the Ruby on Rails team for having validation, or for having uh, English grammar rules. So Rails knows how to pluralize octopus into octopi and all these other things. And we've poked fun at them, you know, in a lighthearted way for years. And, and then I realized, oh shoot, we've got Mexican social security. <laughs> so. Welcome to my talk. Uh, this is about the year ahead. I'm going to be talking about what we'd like to add and also what we'd like to take away. Uh, the scope of time is between now and the next DjangoCon, which will be next year, obviously. Uh, so uh, one, one thing I should say is some of this stuff is definitely on the roadmap. Some of it is sort of probably on the roadmap, and other stuff is kind of crazy, and I haven't really told any of the other core team about. Uh, we'll see what happens. So first things first, let's get some bureaucracy out of the way. Uh, the next version of Django, so we're on 1.4 right now, of course, the next version is coming out uh, by the end of the year. So on October 1st, we're calling a feature freeze, which means no new features. Uh, and we're going to create a branch in GitHub uh, for that version. This is a, a change from how we usually do it. Uh, we usually have had this uh, trunk freeze where you can't actually commit to trunk or master uh, while we do that, which is a huge pain in the butt, and I was strongly advocating for doing this. So fortunately, now we have this. Uh, uh, the, the trunk is, is always ready to be committed to. So here's the timeline, November 1st for a beta, release candidate November, December, and then finally you'll get a Christmas present on uh, December 25th with Django 
So getting that bureaucracy out of the way. Let's talk features. So uh, the, probably the biggest thing, the biggest thing in terms of code change is that we've added experimental Python 3 support. Uh, this, is, this was a monumental project by a whole bunch of people all around the world. It's fantastic. If you've been involved in this, can you stand up and can we applaud you? Yes. This, this involved changing thousands of lines of code? Yeah, he, he's like, yeah, stupid. <laughs> Uh, it's, it's a huge, huge undertaking, and if you haven't been keeping track of this, what we, the strategy that we decided to take was we have one version of Django that works on both Python 2 and Python 3, so that, as you might imagine, requires the code to work well in both environments, and it's very tricky. Especially, the hardest thing about this is the, the string handling, which changes dramatically in Python 3, so we had to do a lot of crazy stuff there. Uh, I have two takeaways for you. If you take nothing away, nothing else than this from this talk, uh, please take this away. Number one, download our uh, current development version, which used to be called Trunk. It's now a master on GitHub. And make sure it works on Python 2 for your application. Uh, we introduced a lot of instability in doing the Python 3 migration stuff. And we would love it if all of you could stress test it with your own apps. Uh, the second thing is also take it and run it on Python 3 and see if you can migrate your app using this document, which is already available. Just Google porting to Python 3 and see what happens when you migrate your app to Python 3. Uh, hopefully it'll just work. Uh, if it doesn't work, awesome, you found a bug, let us know about it and we'll fix it so it'll work. So that's Python 3, really awesome. Uh, I should stress that it's, uh, Jacob made me say this, uh, this is, should be considered alpha uh, software. Uh, when we release it with the next version of Django in December, we're still going to say Python 3 is considered alpha. I don't think we'll be comfor comfortable and confident enough at that point to be able to say, yeah, this is like super production ready. So, but the more of you who, who poke at it right now, the faster we'll be comfortable in making that declaration. So back when Django was originally released in 2005, there was no such thing as pip. Uh, Python package management with dependencies and all that stuff was basically non-existent or just kind of bad. Uh, and for that reason, we always really deeply cared about not having any dependencies and making it as easy as possible to get started with Django. So all you would have to do is get a tarball, unzip it, and boom, you're up and running. A funny thing happened in the last couple of years, actually not so funny, kind of awesome, uh, pip came around, and although it's not without its warts, it's kind of awesome and handles dependencies and all that stuff. So one thing that I'd like to do is start getting our framework split into s smaller pieces. Nothing dramatic at first, uh, but <laughs> some, you know, chop off some things here and there. So returning to our local flavor example, uh, one of the things that I'm going to do in the next couple of weeks is take out local flavor and put it in separate packages. Uh, so out of curiosity, how many of you actively use the local flavor stuff? Okay, maybe a third? Okay. So the plan here is to take all that code, put it in separate GitHub projects, uh, still under the Django brand, and hopefully find people to maintain all of them, which is, could be a little tricky, and uh, leave in a shim in the actual Django contrib dot local flavor so that if you import it from there, it'll actually look back at that. But we're not gonna break your apps right away. Uh, we have a, our standard deprecation policy. These clowns are laughing in the front row. Uh, so in the upcoming Django 1.5, we'll have our 
standard deprecation warning. So if you import from Django.contrib.localflavor, you'll get this warning, but it will still work. In 1.6, uh, those bundled packages are gonna be available, and we're gonna somehow find out a way to have them in those separate packages, but when you install Django via pip, it'll just grab those packages too, so that in essence, it's backwards compatible, you'll still have all the code, it'll just be in different places. And if you import, at that point, if you import from local flavor, it'll just be a shim and it'll import from the real place, which will probably be something like Django underscore contrib, or Django underscore local flavor underscore the country code. And then finally, in 1.7, it'll be gone. Uh, so that's local flavor. There's a couple other things that I'd like to remove. Uh, there's django.contrib.comments. How many of you actually use this? Very, very few people. It doesn't count if you used to work for the Lawrence Journal World. Uh, okay, okay. Uh, this is something that I'd like to do the same thing to. So for local flavor, uh, that's, the process is already in place. We're gonna do that starting with 1.5. With comments, we haven't really talked about this on the mailing list, but it's something I wanna do as well, is sort of put it through that same process. So it'll be backwards compatible. Uh, over the long haul, uh, but over the long haul, it'll go away and be a separate package. Uh, another advantage to that is that this is the kind of thing that uh, would really benefit from faster release cycles. So Django itself is released not so often because we're really concerned about being conservative with making huge changes and we, wanna, we don't wanna break your apps, right, when we have a new version. But for something like a comments package, it probably could use faster release cycles. So it's good for everybody. Another example is Data Browse, uh, which I added a couple of years ago and was really excited about for about two months and then never touched it again. Did anyone actually ever play with Data Browse? Okay, uh, fair number of you. Uh, that was a cool concept, but we never really got around to finishing it, and it's already in the deprecation process uh, and will be a separate package as well. Uh, there's a couple of settings like <laughs> profanities list. Uh, I don't know if any of you noticed this, but we actually did make a backwards incompatible change a couple months-ish ago where we set it, uh, Django used to ship with a list of profanities <laughs> and we, <laughs> we changed it in the base settings to just be an empty list. And uh, that was technically backwards incompatible and I guess somewhere out there there's probably some website where unbeknownst to the site operator people are using the word asshat finally. <laughs> uh, but I think the next step is just for us to remove this setting it, and it was only used by the comments thing anyway. There's a couple of other settings. Uh, send broken link emails. Come on, that's such a it, this is really a leftover from the old Lawrence Journal world days. I don't know if that's really framework level thing. It should be like a third party package or something. Uh, and in fact, uh, come on. Uh, <laughs> so th those last couple ones were sort of just conjecture at this point. We don't have a, a firm plan in place, but for this one we do have the plan in place. The auth profile module is really, really smelly. Uh, and it's just horrible. So let me, let me explain this. The problem with, uh, th this concerns custom user objects. So if you have a user in your application, you're sort of forced to use our user model if you wanna use things like the admin or various frameworks, sub-frameworks. And that's really, really great if you use exactly these fields and nothing more, nothing less. Uh, if you use anything uh, if you use anything less, then you have a lot of waste in here. So, for instance, your app might not need a first name or a last name. You might think that's stupid. Uh, you might not need groups, user permissions. The designation between staff and active, or staff and super user might be ambiguous. Who cares? So it's wasteful. And at the same time, you probably want to add stuff to that, like Twitter username or OAuth stuff or Facebook account or whatever, favorite color. So the traditional way that we've had support for that is by this auth profile module thing where you would create your own model, you would have a one-to-one -one relationship, and then you would add fields. Who, who here has actually, 
who's done that? Oh my God, like everyone, 80%. So it's painful, right? Painful, okay, I'm hearing a lot of nods, okay. Uh, and then what you would do is you would do this auth profile module thing and then access request.user.getprofile, which is a problem for all sorts of obvious reasons. You have two database tables, which is a mental, uh, you know, it's just hard to th hold that in your head. It's also inefficient because you're having to do joins. Uh, it's also just, you have two things in the code as well. You have the, this model and this model. It's just bad news. So we have this new system that Russ has been working on uh, that lets you create your own user model, call it whatever you want. You have whatever fields that you want. Let's say this is my user. He has his favorite beetle, who would be George. <laughs> and then you put in your settings just the path to that model. And then all you do is request that user, and that's that thing. Like, it just magically works. Uh, there are a couple of requirements uh, that we had, a couple of design goals. It needs to be backwards compatible. So if you don't do that, it'll just use the old auth user thing. Totally fine and transparent. And if you supply your own user, you'll have to give it a couple of hints. If you want to use the admin or some other sub-frameworks, you'll have to give it a couple of hints on how to, for instance, authenticate, uh, how to know whether the user can access the admin or not, and a couple of other things which we'll very clearly document, because that has never been documented, and that's not, not so good. So that's coming up. Uh, hopefully by this 1.5 version on Christmas. So I don't, yeah, right? Thanks to Russ for implementing. I don't know, that we're kind of delving into obscure stuff. I don't know if anyone's ever seen this error. <laughs> okay. So the reason this error happens, is th there's a bigger problem. Uh, the problem is that we have settings as a global object and global state. And that causes all sorts of problems. How many of you were in Alex's talk yesterday talking about uh, what, you know, how he would redo Django if he was starting from scratch? Okay, a lot of you. So I've been thinking about the same issues and I was really inspired by Alex also. So he finally came up with an elegant solution to this. So just to, to give you a, a, a finer point on what the problem is, if you have a view function like this, how, how does my model know what the database connection is? It just sort of magically knows your database name, your password, the username, the fact that you're using Postgre instead of crappy MySQL. How does the template language, how does the template loader know what template you're loading? How does it know where those files are? Magically, you know, there's nothing here that, that has it. And that's good because we don't want to write in every single model case, here's the database parameters, right? But, but the way it's implemented right now has this global settings thing. So in case you don't know the way it works behind the scenes, in Django.db, uh, where the, all the model code, the Malcolm crazy Dungeon Master stuff lives, uh, you have this fundamental import from settings, and it does all sorts of stuff based on your settings. And the same thing, in essence, is, is in practice for the template loader. Now. That's a problem for all sorts of reasons which Alex went into in his talk. If you didn't catch it, definitely check it out when it's online. Uh, just, this is a trust, trust me. Uh, one way that we can get around it, and this is, what I, this is a little tenuous and a little controversial because we haven't really talked about it uh, formally, but having, the concept would be having this app object that represents your application. And that, then would be a hook for tying all sorts of state onto, and you would pass that around. It'd be on the request object, it would also be maybe uh, somehow accessible to the command line Django admin and also to a celery task or another task uh, system. So app.query would magically know based on your settings, uh, well, I'll get to that in a moment, uh, and the template would, yeah, I shouldn't use the word magic. Uh, it will unmagically know this stuff. Uh, but here, here's why it's not magic. It's because you'll instantiate this app thing, and I shouldn't say you will, you would use the subjective here. 
uh, set in, send in some settings, send in a root URL, and then just call a run server on it. So it's like a really uh, not frame, it's more of a library kind of approach, less of a framework thing. And then that app instance would be passed as uh, an attribute on the request object. So what do you guys think? Just give me some vocal, it's okay? Okay. If you don't like it, do, clap now. Oh, <laughs> okay. I, I don't even know what to make of that. All right. So JavaScript stuff. Uh, traditionally, we haven't had any ajax -y stuff. You know, there's a couple of thing, bits and pieces here and there. But we've recently added jQuery, mostly so that we could uh, use it in the admin, but we haven't had like super intense JavaScript integration. And the thinking was always that it's kind of like your decision as a developer to do whatever JavaScript framework you want, whatever library, you know, do whatever you want. But I think it's about time uh, for us to, to go to the next level here. And I'll go into the, some, some of the philosophies later, uh, but I'll, I'll start with a couple of examples of what I think we could do uh, to be much, much more 2012. So the first is PJAX. Uh, PJAX is this new-ish, but still not really widely used technique uh, for making web pages seem faster using AJAX. The P stands for push state. So if you think about it, you have, if you request a site, re re request a page, the browser talks to the web framework, which generates a bunch of HTML. If you then go click one of the links on that Wikipedia page, the framework that powers Wikipedia outputs another page, right? Standard stuff that we do in Django all the time. The thing is, those two pages are very similar. So they have the same navigation, they have the same left sidebar, header and footer, and the only thing that's different is the content area and the URL. So, if you think about it, the web framework knows how to create page A, and it knows how to create page B, so shouldn't it be smart enough to figure out what's the diff and just send that over the wire? Uh, that essentially is one way of thinking about PJAX, and it's something I'm very interested in implementing for us. So that is how it would work. Instead of you know, the first time you load a page, it's, it does the right thing and sends the full HTML. It doesn't do some crappy Twitter hash bang stuff where it sends you some other page and then it loads the other page on top of it because that's evil. It loads the real page. And then when you click a link and it happens to be on the same site, it figures out what's different and sends you the, just the differences over the wire. So hitting you over the head with this, the way it would work was you would click a link, the server figures out what's different, changes it in place, and a crucial bit is that it changes the URL so that it looks like you went to a new page, but it's, uh, in practice, this ends up feeling much, much faster. And if you've used GitHub's uh, file browser, you've seen this technique in action. They're, they're using this exact thing. Or if you're using the new 37 Signals Basecamp, uh, you've seen that in action. Super, super uh, fast, speedy, really cool. So the thing is, if if we're a web framework, we know how to create all those different things. We know how to create page A and page B, so it follows that we should probably be able to figure out how to calculate a diff. Uh, the challenge is to do that in a way that's not so slow that you might as well have loaded the whole page in the first place, uh, but I think it's possible. Uh, and my goal is to just be able to add one line of middleware and boom, your, your site just has that. So it magically works. It, it would have a, oh, magic. Uh, it <laughs> delightfully works. Uh, and we have to be really, really careful to set the right expectation on this. It only really would work on certain types of sites that are maybe more browsy, content-y, it wouldn't work. You wouldn't want to use it on like a single page JavaScript app, obviously, because JavaScript would stomp all over itself. That would be bad. Uh, but I think for, for retrofitting, so to speak, old sites to, to be more modern and, and PJAXy, this would be really, really cool. 
I did a full talk about this in Philadelphia a couple months ago, so if you're interested in this, these concepts, check it out at tinyurl.com slash pjaxvideo. And speaking of JavaScript stuff, I think it's time for us to have some real-time solution. Uh, I'm really bummed that the Meteor talk that was scheduled for this morning got rescheduled for tomorrow because I kind of wanted to riff on what he would say. Uh, and I have no idea, and I'm really looking forward to it. Uh, I think that there is, I don't know what it is yet, but over the next year, we're going to figure it out, damn it. Uh, <laughs> Got some. The framework knows when your objects change. The framework knows exactly where your stuff is on the page. The framework knows what media assets you have and all that stuff. So it follows that it should be able to give you some really nice APIs and maybe automate a lot of the, the cruft. So I think it's totally possible. Uh, granted, I don't even know what it is yet, uh, but it is in theory, possible. That's their lie dragons, dangerous. Uh, but I think we, we can have uh, some sort of useful real-time uh, solution. And finally, I'm gonna, I wanted to leave plenty of time for questions, but I wanted to end on this more philosophical note. So sorry for getting all MBAE and charty, uh, but the way I see it, this is a rudimentary graph of uh, the continuum between content sites and applications. This, this content site versus application thing is something that has been banded about since we originally open sourced. Uh, back in 2005, David Hannemeyer Hansen from Rails and I did this event called Snakes and Rubies in Chicago where we demonstrated both of our frameworks. And he said, oh yeah, I think Django would be really good for content sites. And we were like, oh, what does that even mean? And and I still don't really know what, I'm, what it means, but I kind of, you know, I'm willing to buy it just for the sake of argument. Uh, so if you look at this continuum, you have content sites and applications. I think that most sites on the internet by far are content sites. It's sort of this huge slope. The, the, the graph there is how many sites on the internet, you know, these are very exact numbers, of course. And then how many applications, where applications would be something like Gmail, where it's like a single page thing, something like RDO, uh, where it's not really a page metaphor as much as a desktop app within the browser. Our sweet spot traditionally has been where that green arrow is. I hope those of you in the back can see it. It's definitely content sites were awesome for that. And a, a fair, you know, midway through, super awesome. Of course, you can use Django for anything. RDO uses Django for, and they're super application-y. But I would say the sweet spot is there. And then by sweet spot, I mean what in reputation for us. It's also uh, what, what we think about as core developers. It's the type of tools that we, that we have, like the admin. Uh, that's really our sweet spot. But what's been happening recently, over, and it's super, super recent, like the last couple of years, is that Things are shifting so that even content sites are becoming more application-y and everything's sort of moving to the right on this graph. So even something like uh, Twitter, which I would consider a content site, right, because it's got pages, there's a permalink to a tweet, there's a permalink to a person's timeline. Uh, that's got application-y things because it's got the auto re reload at the top, it's got various things happening via Ajax. So that's sort of this weird hybrid between content site and application. And I think that's, that's an area where there's the most potential for a web framework. So Django, Rails, PHP stuff has got content sites covered cold. We've got that down cold. Uh, stuff like Meteor is coming in for, and, and JavaScript front end frameworks are coming in for the application side. There's nothing really awesome for that middle site where people care about URLs, damn it, and they care about the fact that the first time you go to a page, it's not going to do some crazy JavaScript stuff. They care about the fact that if you w get a page, it doesn't require uh, JavaScript support in wget. Uh, you know, just cool URLs don't change and just the bedrock of the internet, which can't die. Uh, 
But at the same time, we want to augment that with really cool JavaScript stuff that people are expecting these days. So where I really want to take Django in the next year is, is moving that green arrow boop, to the right so that we can have, you know, tackle that market, so to speak. Sorry, I've been doing a startup for five years. I can't, I can't help thinking about it like a market. Uh, but I think there's huge potential, and, and I'm really, really excited about it. And with that, we have 10 minutes for questions. Thanks for using Django. Yay. Yes. Adrian, I just got to say, this is going to be fantastic for testing third-party reusable, pluggable Django apps. I've hated doing this. The app object is going to make that possible. The, the app thing? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, definitely watch Alex's thing, if you haven't already we talked about that. Hi, um, I find it a bit confusing that you're saying you want to make Django less monolithic, and at the same time, you s want to add more stuff uh, especially the real-time stuff. Come on, that it makes I, perfect that sense. I, that, <laughs> that I believe could happily live outside core. Like, people are doing and you can do real-time apps that are basically Django, and then the real-time stuff is handled through something else. I don't see where the problem with that is and why Django itself should have a real-timey thing. Yeah, that, that's a fair point, and, and honestly, I totally agree. And the solution might very well be somebody outside the Django core team, you develop some really awesome third party or really awesome uh, real time thing and we just say in our documentation, use this. Okay. Or we, we probably want to be fair, you know, we don't want to play favorites necessarily, but give people a clear path. So does that make sense? I, I don't, the answer is I don't think it's necessarily going to be in Django proper. It depends on what happens. Yeah. Hey, um, Adon loves the idea of breaking things out, um, but what's ad how does admin fit into this? Ah, uh, is that going to be one that gets broken out? I mean, that's an, it's an application unto itself almost. Just happens to use Django. Totally. Uh, you know, I don't know. We could break it out. Uh, it would probably benefit from faster release cycles. Definitely. Uh, at the end of the day, it's kind of like six one way half dozen the other uh, because it's so easy these days with pip and things on github virtual lamb to just install things randomly they don't have to be one monolithic thing so i don't know um, yeah i don't have an answer specifically about whether we'll break it out but we might I guess to be the third question in a row about breaking things out and pip, uh, there's still a copy of simple JSON included inside of Django. Uh, you want to break that out and pip install it as well? <laughs> <laughs> that shouldn't be in there because. <laughs> oh, Windows. Oh, Windows Python had bad JSON, so we have to use, include that. The Python version 2.6 then, probably? Some, some Python version had a bad standard library JSON. Okay. This seems like a reasonable excuse. <laughs> so I'm an old school Plone hacker, and uh, I remember when we blo broke up Plone and Zope, and uh, this is kind of a plea to avoid the anti-pattern that we fell into, which is that everybody ended up being his or her own release manager, because we did releases so seldom. Uh, and there are these enormous you know, build out, but essentially requirements files. I'm gonna use this version, this package, this version, this package, this version, this. And every app that shipped said, well, I need this version of this and this version of this, so you could never get anything to play nicely together. And uh, it was hellish and I didn't like it and I left. That's the kind of stuff we need to hear going into this. Um, yeah, Don't noted. <laughs> um, I suppose to build on his uh, observation a little bit, um, with this less monolithic model of Django, are you um, planning on supporting a core set of packages or favoring them in some way so that there is um, sort of uh, dev support and something that the community can rely on uh, to uh, you know, not have this uh, immense number of packages that require all these 
uh, dependencies and things like that. Yeah, uh, now let me address this question and the previous one with a m larger meta response. Uh, this stuff was very much early uh, conceptually. So we know we're definitely gonna do the thing with local flavor. Uh, we know we're going to deprecate data browse. Comments, we probably will do the same thing. But for other stuff, who knows? Uh, we'll just see what happens, how, how it works. Um, I'm definitely, I mean, our tradition is so user focused to the, to the point of it has to be super easy to install. Uh, I do not want dependency hell to happen. Trust me. Uh, so I think we'll think very, very carefully about the things that we break out, if we even break more stuff out. I don't know. Well, I like the idea of making stuff easier to test and not having the global settings. I really, really don't like that syntax. I think it's more confusing to users. Um, you know, have you thought about having a way to just pass the settings in, for instances, where you want to do that? I think most sites use a settings file and, and having all that extra syntax around it for the off case of, of wanting to change settings or not having settings global seems weird. Yeah, that, that could be a better, better way to go. Uh, this is very early. So yeah, I haven't made any uh, like final decisions on the syntax. Um, this idea of that you were talking about with PJAX and like a DOM diff type object is something that uh, we've talked about a lot where I work. Um, and I was just wondering, uh, obviously you need something that you're going to be comparing it to and that uh, comparison is going to happen on the server. Uh, have you like, I don't know how far down the rabbit hole you've gone, but have you thought about how you would do that in a way that's not going to you know, really make things chug? And right, I, so I gave that talk uh, twice and the second time I gave it a group on where it was all sorts of Ruby developers and we had a really awesome conversation afterward about like in the real world, is that actually gonna help? And I think we uh, did some testing and found out that if, you, if all you do is replace the whole body, uh, you get all the benefits without the complexity of figuring out the exact like divs and spans that are different. So that could be like a halfway solution that gets you the speed and responsiveness of PJAX without all the overhead of doing that calculation. But yeah, that I mean, you're right on, that's a total interesting challenge about this. Related to that question, another popular alternative, of course, to PJAX is to use some form of passing JSON blobs and using some form of potentially JavaScript powered templating. Uh, have you actually, do you know performance wise if, there, if PJAX is just as good because of the trade off on the client or are those trade offs very domain specific. Well, here's the problem with JavaScript templates. All of a sudden you have two templates, right? Two template worlds. And to me, that's just like too complicated mentally. That's too much stuff to think about. And I'd rather uh, send uh, rendered stuff over the wire than JSON. But it totally depends on the app. I mean, I'm working on something now in my spare time that it's all JSON and that's, you know, it's very boring from the perspective of the web framework. Uh, but not, not, not a fan of uh, having templates in, in both JavaScript and Python. Uh, same topic, same proposal almost. Uh, but I don't know if you saw Jim Day's talk yesterday about with uh, handlebars. But, no. um, you know, the great advantage of that, you know, or any templating language which, can, you know, is logicless. So Django already has a tradition of that. And, you know, then we could essentially be doing it both on the client and the server side. Um, so, and the other thing I wanted to warn on the request.app thing is uh, from the Drupal community, it's a very similar thing. And uh, they, the good part was that, you know, there was a layer of indirection that uh, actually made a lot of apps sort of more willing to talk to each other, I think. Hmm. Um, you know, the bad part 
was that uh, tracebacks looked very incomprehensible because the magic, magic or delightfulness that happens in between that like request.app is always this like really, really scary get adder, you know, like in three levels of, you know, I don't know what the hell is going on kind of thing. Hmm. And, uh, you know, so somehow we should, we should try to avoid that. Sure, that's a really good point. I'm gonna write it down in bed. Tracebacks. Uh, yeah. This is mostly just a comment for people in the room who are wondering whether or not request.app is useful or an edge case. Um, I know for me, it's often very hard to test uh, third-party applications or even my own applications because I have to have an example project or I have to use a project that I'm using to like run a, a test server on my development machine and even just doing that I'll like run a test and it'll be failing and it'll be because I have some setting that I set somewhere and forgot about it and it's causing things to happen that I did not intend and that have nothing to do with the test suite. Um, so I, I really don't right. think it's much of an edge case. I think it's more making it possible for us to actually reasonably test our applications. Excellent. Hi, Adrian. Hey. I'm going to ask the really hard hitting question of the day. Kay. What's the favorite gypsy jazz song of the moment? <laughs> well, uh, man, the hardball. Uh, I think the the best Django Reinhardt recording is The Man I Love, which is George Gershwin's song, and it's got, uh, a, it starts off with just Django on guitar and a piano, and then it, the, the whole band comes in, it gets really intense, it's, it's beautiful. And fun fact, uh, I originally wanted to make a Django screencast, and I put it off because... Uh, I was going to do it when we reached 1.0, and that took like forever. <laughs> and by that point, like everyone was already using it, so it didn't need a screencast. Uh, but here's an idea for someone who wants to make a screencast. Uh, I had an, a uh, choreographed screencast where I played this song, The Man I Love by Django Reinhardt, and every note of music corresponded to a key press. So uh, it's like da 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 da, and you see like D J A N G O, uh, and it would have been really awesome. And especially for this song because it like gets more and more intense, and like okay, now the admin comes, now this comes, you know. Uh, so someone there should do it. All right, thank you very much. It's here for Adrian. Thanks, guys. <laughs>